Welcome to this tutorial. In this one we're going to be talking about the meninges and the spaces between the meningeal layers and paying particular reference to trauma and what happens when the vessels that supply the brain and the dura end up bleeding and bleeding into some of these spaces and causing uh, serious symptoms. We're going to start off by drawing a diagram which is going to represent the outermost layer of bone, which is going to be the skull in this case, all the way down to the brain surface itself, which will be the cortex. So the skull is our outer surface, and our next layer down is going to be our dura mater, which is going to be our first layer of our meninges. I'm just going to put dura in there at the side, and we must remember that inside the skull the dura splits into two layers and one of those is called the endosteal layer so I'm just going to abbreviate that as EL there and the innermost layer is called the meningeal layer like that okay and that has particular significance those two layers we're going to come back and revisit those a bit later on while we're here we're going to draw on a potential space that can exist between the bone which is the skull and the endosteal layer the outer layer and this is going to be called the extradural space. So let's just label that on. Now it's important to remember that this is just a potential space. So usually the endosteal layer of the dura is adhered tightly to the layer of the skull, to the innermost layer of the skull, and this space only exists when it's forced apart by a bleeding blood vessel. So it's worth remembering, but we're drawing these on because we want to come back and revisit those spaces and think about the clinical significance of that space. So we've got our dura on. The next layer down is going to be a layer known as the arachnoid layer. So let's put AL there. And the arachnoid layer has these trabeculations, which are very characteristic of it, these spider-like projections that come down and join another layer of the meninges called the pia and it's in fact the pia which is adhered to the brain surface and in particular the cortex, the cerebral cortex and it will follow all of the individual grooves of the, the, the cortex and go deep into each sulci and follow each of the gyri and in actual fact when you look at these brain sections in the laboratory you'll find that you won't be able to tell the brain surface uh, and the pia apart but you will be able to see if the arachnoid layer is present and of course the dura mater is a, a very thick layer and it should be quite obvious to you on specimens. So we've got our full picture here from our out outermost surface of bone all the way down to the brain itself and we need to go back and just revisit some of those spaces. We've got our extradural space but now we've got another potential space called the subdural space. And again, it's worth remembering that this space is a potential space and not a true space. So what we mean by that is that usually the arachnoid layer is tightly adhered to the meningeal layer of the dura. And this space only occurs really when there is uh, this trauma and rupture of a vessel that can bleed into it and force those layers apart. Our next layer is actually called the subarachnoid space and this is different to the other two because it's actually a true space and we would normally expect to find in there, we'd expect to find CSF which is cerebral spinal fluid and CSF travels between the arachnoid layer and its trabeculations and the pia layer of the meninges. So here we have a basic representation of the layers of tissue that we'd expect to find from the bone all the way down to the brain surface. So what we need to do now is we need to go back and revisit some of those layers and think about where some of the blood vessels are and what would happen if they were to rupture. So first of all we need to go back to our endosteal layer of the dura and we can actually draw on a blood vessel which would exist in that layer. So we get a drawing 
red in its space there because it's in fact an artery and it's in, actually called the middle meningeal artery and the middle meningeal artery is a vessel that comes as a branch from the maxillary artery it enters through the skull through foramen spinosum and it tightly follows the skull all the way round to its lateral surface and creates a groove in the skull which can be seen when observing a skull in, in the lab and it runs over an area of the skull called the terion and the middle meningeal artery branches into an anterior and posterior branch. So what can happen is that an extradural hematoma can occur after a traumatic head injury for example where there might be a skull fracture which ruptures the middle meningeal artery and the pressure from that bleed separates the dura from the bone and we end up with blood draining into this space which actually creates this space so before this vessel starts bleeding this space doesn't exist and then it bleeds into the extra dural space forcing apart the endosteal layer of the dura and the skull and we end up with an arterial bleed that bleeds quite quickly because it's an artery and usually it would be a surgical emergency where a burr hole would need to be drilled in the skull to relieve the pressure from that growing bleed and if that doesn't happen then that can, the, the person suffering from this trauma can eventually go into a coma and die. So that's our middle meningeal artery and an arterial bleed into the extradural space. For our next consideration we actually need to look at this endosteal layer and the meningeal layer associated with the dura and I said that this had significance and it does because these two layers separate around the part of the skull at various points and it separates to form what we call venous sinuses so I need to erase part of those layers and I need to draw in a representation of what's going to be a venous sinus it's going to be full of venous blood so we're going to represent that with some blue color and we can label that as well so that's a venous sinus so we've got these venous sinuses occupying positions around the skull and they are points in which the endosteal layer and the meningeal layer will separate and what's important about that is that actually fact this venous blood is coming from somewhere so we need to find out where it's coming from and it's actually coming from blood vessels which exist in the subarachnoid space so we need to go down to our subarachnoid space and create a little area in here in which we can draw a blood vessel and again this blood vessel is going to be a cerebral vein and in order for blood to drain from the cerebral vein it needs to enter into another vessel and this vessel is going to drain like this all the way into the venous sinus and you'll notice that in doing so it's going to cross the subarachnoid space so this vessel here has a name and it's called a bridging vein I was going to abbreviate that as BV and this down here has a name which we mentioned before and this is a cerebral vein for CV for that so let's go back and think about that bridging vein in relation to our potential space the subdural space so the bridging vein crosses that space although it's not a true space it will actually if it was to bleed as what tends to happen is that when we get a subdural hematoma we get a bleed from a bridging vein crossing between the arachnoid layer and the dura which bleeds to create this space we get venous blood in here and a subdural 
hematoma occurs usually from a vein, so it's normally venous in origin, and it can occur most commonly in the very young. It tends to happen through things like shaken baby syndrome, where these vessels are very vulnerable. And it can happen in the elderly, where we get a certain amount of cortical shrinkage or atrophy in an elderly patient, and these bridging veins become particularly tall as they stretch across the arachnoid layer and meningeal layer and become a bit brittle and can easily uh, become ruptured. So most susceptible to a subdural hematoma would be the very old or the very young. Let's move on down to our subarachnoid space. Now this is our only true space and usually it would have CSF in there but there's also blood vessels that exist in there. We've already seen that we've got a cerebral vein. Well, we're also going to have a cerebral artery as well and let's just draw that on. A cerebral artery will run in the layer invested by pia above so it'll actually be invested in the pia and every now and then some branches will come away from there and travel down into brain tissue and these branches of a cerebral artery drawn that quite large there, not normally you represented that large. This is a cerebral artery and this is a branch of a cerebral artery in here that would enter into what we call perivascular space and have a sleeve of pia that travels with it as it enters into the cortex or deep into the brain. And what we normally find is that if these particular vessels rupture, most commonly they rupture because there is uh, an aneurysm there that's ruptured and this would lead to uh, stroke. So these cerebral vessels that actually supply brain tissue would be either interrupted or would bleed and the blood would either enter around brain tissue itself, which would actually be around the brain parenchyma, so it would actually be around neurons and be particularly catastrophic, or it would bleed so we can get blood in and amongst brain tissue in here, or we can get blood in here, which is a bleed into the subarachnoid space, and a bleed into the subarachnoid space would be called a subarachnoid hematoma, and like I said, this would normally be the result of a stroke or the bleeding of an arterial aneurysm. Okay, so we've basically covered the basic anatomy of the meninges and we've looked at where some of the blood vessels would arise and we've looked at those spaces which they would bleed into and given an example of a clinical scenario where that might happen. Okay, I hope that's been useful. Subscribe to Sultan Brain Hub for more videos to help explain the mysteries of the brain.